Well, hello. Welcome to my cellar. Added a little extra light tonight. We're going to see what we can do about making these a little better to see and get the camera angle adjusted right. Several things to talk about tonight. First off, I want to start with uh, an exciting announcement. There's a Kickstarter coming this Monday. And... Uh, that's the 26th. It's called Fight This Mutant. It's a companion piece, if you will, to a previous book called Check This Artifact, both of whom are uh, written by Jim Wampler, who did Mutant Crawl Classics for Goodman's. Um, you're going to love this book. <laughs> uh, I know I've seen it. Uh, I'm, I'm listed as the editor. I'm also listed as a source of evil ideas, so we'll, we'll let it go at that. But, uh, <coughs> pardon me, there's new spells, new items, a new class, and high-level spells up to fifth level, which I understand were uh, sadly lacking in the original. So uh, check it out. It goes live on Monday. Jim and I are leaving for Game Hole Con on Wednesday, and um, check it out. I've seen I've, I've seen the stretch goals. Uh, it's an amazing package. I think you'll really uh, I think you'll really find a lot to uh, enjoy about it. Fight this mutant! It'll be kickstarted live on Monday. <laughs> um, a less pleasant note. I've spoken of him before, my good friend Juan Martinez, who's um, gravely ill. He's now been admitted to the hospital. So I ask that you uh, keep my friend Juan in your prayers and thoughts and vibes or um, whatever your uh, modus operandi is in that regard. He needs some help. He also had a GoFundMe trying to help raise some money to pay off an enormous debt. Um, those of you who have been to um, Gen Con auctions when I was there, my last one I think was 16, will remember him um, as the guy who was always putting together these really amazing things out of cards for the charity auction. And he also does something really astonishing. I want, I'm going to try and get this up here where you can see it. That is a penny that has been cut into a dragon. One continuous piece of metal. This is some of the art that this guy does. Amazing stuff. He, he takes pennies and turns them into flowers and roses and things. Um... He has, a, he has a Facebook page. There's probably a website link there somewhere. Juan Martinez. You'll know you're on the right page when you get the picture of the guy that looks like a steampunk version of uh, uh, Tommy Chong. Great guy. I know he's, he's got some stuff he still needs. He's, he's trying to sell stuff to raise money. Check him out. And uh, keep him in your thoughts and prayers, if you would, please. I'd appreciate it. I know he can use the help. I know that when I was suffering cancer uh, and going through it, I know that uh, I got energy from somewhere that I can't quite explain. And um, anyway, um, okay, this is an apology about some, oh, the random guy. He's got a name calling Vendetta Against Glue Stick. Okay, well, I didn't know. Like I said, I get these weird things and I read them for the humor. Um, moving on, did that compilation of quotes from Dragon's Foot ever get made or printed? There's an amazing trove of insights and history there. Well, actually, the person that set out to do that has made considerable progress. Um, 120 some thread pages 
is an enormous amount of compilation work for somebody who's doing this just as a, a fun favor for a friend because he thought it'd be interesting to do. <laughs> that said, um, perhaps this winter we'll, uh, I'll talk with him some more and uh, we'll consider putting out uh, a partial, making a partial available um, and then uh, finishing it off at a later date. I, I don't know. I, it's totally out of my hands. I'm not paying this guy a nickel. Uh, he he simply said, "Hey, I'll, I'd like to do this," and I said, "Okay, um, here you go, bud. Knock yourself out." And, well, not literally. I wouldn't want that to happen. Um, okay, let's. Here we go. This is this is this topic is, is still germane. It's, it remains relevant, and that's um, it has to do with how we achieve inclusiveness in role playing. How can others strive to achieve inclusiveness? Now, this is a long, long piece, but it's worth the read. I've had great success eliminating race altogether in my games. Class is what matters. Sometimes people want to be a hobbit, a living statue, or a person with horns. That kind of stuff doesn't affect much. It's more social flavor than min-max advantage. Playing with women in the group makes it harder as a gem to spring obvious traps on people. That's right. <laughs> They'll fall for shit like guys do, do they? Uh, it's not, they're, they're much more suspicious and with good reason, and that's why I find them more fun to play with. Um, let's see. Also, they usually force me to think of why monsters have their antagonisms towards people. Well, yeah. Uh, lady players want to know what the logic is behind it. Um, most of us guys, when we were first set it out, we didn't give a damn well what the lo logic was. <laughs> Let's go out and kill shit. Kill things, take their shit, and uh, level up. Um, if someone like a goblin can use tools, how come they cannot be made more friendly and just be a different kind of person? My solution is that they eat people and need whatever it is about human bodies in order to have proper nutrition, which means they're either suffering and picking off the most vulnerable society or they have human ranches and slaughterhouse to help their population grow. I like the way this guy thinks. Uh, how do you handle the relationship between players and the human-like races, and how are players not end up as Vikings robbing churches or Spanish abusing people for silver? And that's a that's a hell of a question, a lot in there, and it's not anything I'm qualified to definitively answer. Um, there used to be a term called uh, Judeo-Christian that I think uh, is outdated now, uh, it should be, and perhaps we should refer to the three great religions as the people of the book, because they all share the Old Testament. Um, that ethic teaches that life is sacred and that uh, there's an inherent good or evil in people and that the golden rule uh, comes into you know comes into effect. That's a prevalent uh, that's a prevalent uh, vibe or ethos or uh, I don't pick your pick your word in in uh, you know you just know it's not right to do certain things because that's the way we're raised. And um, how do we not become how do we how do we deal with being that in a game when we're not supposed to be that outside? Okay, we can argue that the game is the escapism and it'll let you go have all the bloody fantasies you want and therefore live a nice, peaceful Mr. Milk Toast life in society. And hey, if that works for you, wonderful. How do we not become Vikings? Well, if I knew some clever songwriters. Sponsors, are you listening? There's a great parody waiting to be made on the Simon and Garfunkel song. It's called It's All Happening at the Zoo. But for years, I've been singing my own ditty version of it. Let's all go killing at the zoo. And we're all going to be a bunch of first levels, and we're just going to go running through like a bunch of deranged knights at the dinner table, or worse, the little peewees of, uh, of nitros. 
And we're going to go, okay, ooh, I killed a llama. How many EPs do I get for that? Make a great song. But we know it's intrinsically not a good thing to go kill and slaughter the animals in the zoo simply for gaining experience points. Kind of defies the uh, whole purpose and ethic of what experience points are. So how do we deal with intelligent races? Well, I don't, I don't find a problem with that, I guess, because, because you're intelligent does not mean that your worldview is the same as mine, that you, our worldviews are compatible. What I think is acceptable is not necessarily what you think is access, acceptable and vice versa. And so there are orcs and goblins in that. They live in, the, they live in, in, in darkness, we'll say, both spiritual and, and virtual. Um, they don't have the ethic of uh, the the spark of good, the touch of divine, wh however you want to define that. All right. Um, evil people, humans, have the, the spark of the divine, and it gets twisted somewhere according to the society's norms. Now, the thing about societies and their norms is that the laws and those things are necessary or else a people will wipe itself out. If you didn't have laws in that and we just had a pure D&D &D world, eventually um, either the ogres would rule the world or we, they, some humans would kill everything and would no longer be able to breed and would die out. It's magic. It's fantasy. It doesn't have to have logic to be fun. But logic helps. The underpinnings of logic help us make our way down that tunnel of fantasy. Certainly. Um, certainly we as human beings on this earth have shameful periods in our history. Um, we, could, we could say that the Vikings didn't know any better. They'd not been exposed to the ethic of the book. They were pagans. And as many of them were converted, they quit being, you know, pagan raiding Vikings. Yeah, sure, some of them converted because it was convenient, all right. But by and large, that is part of what civilizes people is an imposition of what is good and what is bad. Now you can say it's what is good and what is bad through through religious teachings, or you can go, ooh, that's bad, and kill the guy that did the bad thing, and then the rest of them go, oh, well, I guess I won't do that. It's bad. Um, there's, no ex there's no excuse whatsoever for what the Spanish did to North America and South America. No, no excuse whatsoever. They claim to be the most educated people in the world. Of course, by today's standards, we know they were evil, evil, ignorant bastards. But what they did to destroy the Mayan and the Aztec cultures and the Toltecs and the Tomecs and everybody else, everything that was remaining in uh, Central and South America, they wiped it out and destroyed it. And they knew better. They knew better. They professed to be Christians. And their idea was, you know, be a Christian and, and we'll work you to death on the haciendas or don't and we'll just kill you because you won't convert. So how do we become that not being that? Well, the DM has to kind of be the ultimate arbiter in all these things. It's got to be what he finds repugnant. If he finds it repugnant, don't do it. If the majority of the players find it repugnant, don't do it. To claim that you got to eat the liver of this thing you just killed because you, know, you know, for some esoteric religion reason, reason, pardon me, um, and and the rest of the group finds that re your your eating habits repugnant. Well, then, in real life, that person would be shunned or turned upon and killed. There's a DM, you know, I see your players turn upon each other, killing each other. Uh, because then you got to get into alignments and what's good and what's bad and atonement. And, phew, 
oh, lots of stuff there. Lots of stuff you got to get into. A lot of stuff that, uh, that I never bothered with. All right? A lot of stuff that I never bothered with. Um, you can domesticate certain species that are very intelligent, like dogs, cats. Um, can you... Can you make an can you make can you make a pet out of an orc or a goblin? You have about the same chance of making a pet out of a wildcat or um well take a wolverine, a wildcat, a cougar, um, take any intrinsically violent animal, wild animal, and um, they will always be ca capable of turning on you and mauling you and killing you because they will revert to type. So there you go. Now you can use that stereotype, if you will. Monsters are of a type that don't follow. Okay. Um, they, they, they can, you can coexist with a, a tribe of goblins in the, in the vicinity or whatever. If you each have some mutual, if there's a mutual benefit, you can coexist with them. Certainly. Unless you're a paladin, of course. <laughs> you just want to kill them all and fry them. Uh, as far as orientation and, and all that, what the hell difference does it make on a gaming table? I don't care. I, I run games for strangers. That's the only kind of games I run now. Is I run games for strangers. And I'm not so quick and speedy that I get there first. But I often get to the table before too many of them, unless I've been waylaid somewhere. And so as I'm sitting at the table and I'm walking up, all I do in my mind is I outwardly register what they appear to me to be. Young or old, male or female. And I don't look below the surface. I don't give a shit. It doesn't matter. Who you claim, who you, wh what you identify yourself to be, and who you want to date doesn't have any bearing on the game at the table. It shouldn't. Sure, it could, but nah, in most cases, it shouldn't. And you can't get into all the things that might go wrong or else then you'd be there all night figuring out all the shit that might go wrong. You might be thinking of shit that nobody even thought of before. Um, okay. I had a little response from my uh, 10 poorly educated counties comment. And the gentleman said, well, I'm not considered educated. You know, quote marks and you know, little fine quotes. I'm not considered educated because of how far I went in school. Yeah, but the fact that he was able to correspond with me legibly, intelligently on Facebook proves that education doesn't come automatically with a slip of paper that says you did it. I've known lots of people in my lifetime who didn't complete a lot of schooling, but who's insatiable curiosity whose desire to know more stood them in great stead and they did they did well in their lives without any formal training but now i got to talk about what does education provide and yes i i'm a former school teacher yes i have a master's degree in education so my biases are plain what i feel that education should provide is exposure to many ideas. Now, four plus four is always going to be eight. I'm not saying give them a way that it could be nine or could be seven, but many different viewpoints. When you study history, or, oh, all right, I, I always use history. Let's take geography. The study of geography can teach you so much if you approach it as um, 
okay, those people eat all this kind of food that I don't like. And then you study the geography of where they live and you find out that everything they eat is based on what grows in the part of the world that their culture flourished in. And so while it might seem strange to you, it's absolutely normal to them. Geography can teach you a lot about culture. A lot. Also, if you have a good exposure to ideas, you're better capable of picking and choosing and making your own decisions and not relying on other people who bray louder to make up your mind for you. I believe that education provides exposure to different ideas. And your job as the educated is to see these ideas, absorb them, pick and choose them, and decide how they're going to affect you for the rest of your life. If you're not educated, you tend to listen to whoever brays the loudest. Educated doesn't mean you finished high school, doesn't mean you got a college school. Shit, I got three degrees, so what? All right, that's not what makes me educated. What makes me educated is the fact that I read, that I question, that I listen to other people's opinions, that I gather facts. And then I make a decision. I have facts to weigh against I have what happened before to weigh against what might happen now or what might happen in the future. I don't have somebody braying in my ear and playing on my basest emotions and my greatest intrinsic, almost unrealized fears. That's what education gives you. And exposure to other peoples, other ideas, other cultures, and the ability to make a decision on your own. On your own. Uh, okay. In response to the talking about uh, um, modules and campaigns. To see T1 to 4, G1 to 3, D1 to 3, Q1 and the Slaver series were my favorite campaigns. And um, the World of Greyhawk has always been my favorite campaign setting. I thought you mentioned that you spent a lot of time on creating World of Greyhawk. No, nope, 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 nope. If I ever, if I ever gave that impression, I was wrong. Um, the, the Greyhawk was purely Gary's and, and maybe some of Rob's and whoever else played in it but I never had anything to do with it. I, I, I wish I had, but no, that all transpired as I was leaving and after I left. Um, is there any, kind of, okay, no, there wasn't anything that I wanted to put in. And he always tries to mul link multiple adventures together, connects them in a plausible way, so that it's rare that it'll be a one-off adventure and more like a continuing saga. And then the next one goes, am I gonna continue camp? Can, little, 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 little. Must be late. Am I going to publish my own campaign world? I don't have one. Yes, I do. All right. Back to the first question. Um, I didn't have anything to do with Greyhawk. I think it's always better to uh, tie the hook for the next one into the end of the previous one. It does give you a sense of continuity, a sense of... Uh, not turning in and going, oh, hell, this is episode three of the second season. And last time I looked, I was on episode five of the first one. Um, it doesn't it doesn't do that to you. Um, I don't have a campaign setting in that I've never compiled one altogether. I've written bits and pieces and I've, I've assumed chunks out of my world and put them in all the things that I've written. <laughs> Now, they're just now only starting to be uh, published. 
but I have a particularly big opus that I hope to get uh, done sometime in the next couple of years that's enormous. It's all outdoors. It encompasses an entire um, uh, desert-like, almost in a desert-like continent and has all the history of the people and the cataclysms that led to all this. I've written a lot of that stuff, but I've never compiled it all together because I wrote it in bits and pieces to explain what was going on in the adventures that I was writing back in the, uh, oh, back in uh, the uh, 2000 and aughts and the early, uh, the early uh, tens. Um, so I don't really have a campaign world. I have a world, my name, all right, it's my, uh, my, my, uh, my planet is called, or my, my world is called Macanda. And, uh, the language, of course, is Macandarin. <laughs> That's how I know how to pronounce Boulet, because it's in my language. Anyway, without getting sidetracked on that again, um, let's see, what else? Uh, so I don't, I don't, I, I sold all my campaign notes. I, I auctioned, them, I sold them all off for charity. And um, I, to this day, I'm pretty sure it's pretty disappointing because it was it was all my notes, notes like the notes you kind of take in class. Because um, at the time when I was doing this, I was running it all by the seat of my pants, and I'd start out at 10 o'clock or 10:30 on Saturday morning with an idea of where we were going and what we we're going to do, and I'd have a map ready, you know. But then how it happened and where it went and all that, and sometimes I'd change things. They'd already run into too much stuff. Because again, this you got to remember this. This was in the first year of the game, and the, the the play was being refined and such. So, um, my campaign notes were really a set of notes on play testing on how to change it and polish the game. So, no, there isn't a world out there. But someday I might. Yeah, there is a world. It's not all done. Um, and now for the dice thieves in everybody's family. Um, he, as he was reminded as a kid, his parents had game nights with other parents in the neighborhood, like Monopoly, Truly Pursuit, and like, and he still remembers being yelled at because he had all the six sliders for the D&D game. How did I, how many times? Well, I didn't get scolded for being the dicey for D&D because D&D didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, I did have a bad habit of uh, taking, uh, like if there's some red dice in this game and I like the red dice, I'd go get them out to play some other game. Uh, and I was always using the Yahtzee dice for something else. Um, <clears throat> but I, I played pretty much uh, standard published type games back then. Um, the only thing I made up was the war games I did in the sandbox, with my firecrackers and army men. Um, love it. The basement is the best place to be. Well, of course, I love my cellar. Um, we we uh, finished our cellar many years ago and I got my pool table over here and beyond it's my pinball machine and above it's my dartboard and back over there is my TV and my stereo. So, I mean, yeah, but this is our family room, our entertainment center. And this is, this corner is my office, which you can see a little better tonight because I decided to turn on some more light. Now, my last thing to talk about tonight, I was really kind of surprised to see this. It came up on some thread somewhere, and then it spread to a couple other threads, like interesting ideas and, and arguments do. Pardon me. Ah, little Mountain Dew. It had to do with who kept the character sheets. I was stunned. Number one, by the question. Number two, through about 13, were by some of the responses. <coughs> I think it goes to my concept of cheating in gaming. You cheat playing a game, you're not cheating anybody but yourself. Beat me cheating, I don't give a shit. You had to cheat to beat me. That's a moral victory to me. Uh, I never, ever considered keeping my players' character sheets. Never did. I trusted them. 
I look back at it now, <clears throat> probably for a couple of reasons. Number one, we didn't tote up EPs after every adventure. Uh, <laughs> the way we played and, and the enthusiasm we showed the game, it, we'd go two, three, sometimes four sessions. Oh, hell, when are we going to get experience? Oh, I don't know. I take a half hour, figure it all up, and people get bumped. <coughs> and back then, we didn't train. So, uh, you know, oh, boom, boom, up, you're up. Because uh, I still don't believe in training. I believe that um, making another level simply is an indication of surviving to that point. Therefore, you are that good. You don't have to go train some more. So I didn't, we didn't worry about that. I, I never, I never considered it. Um, when my buddies and I, on a Wednesday night, play a game that we can't finish, yeah, we take photographs on our phones, simply so we know how to start again. Not so anybody doesn't cheat. Um, granted, our group, is uh, we're five guys to pay attention to what everybody else is doing. But just as often, hey, you forgot to get your, as, oh, didn't you pay for? I mean, it's just, we kind of keep ourselves honest. We've all, we've always played board games like that and minis. Um, I never considered cheating. Um, no, they're, <coughs> pardon me. Allergies are kicking my butt this fall. We had a big bonfire hunt earlier tonight. I've been coughing all night. The fact that I held off as long as I did is amazing. <clears throat> so where was I? Oh, cheating. Um, we had some fudges that we did in minis, but it was always like, uh, if you were a wise player, you knew what the you you took. No, no, uh, uh, don't do that. But if the other guy was too dumb to realize you're walking down the edge of the board. With your fingers spread like this, counting how many fingers it is, is getting a rough range estimation. Well, hey, but we never fudged on the where does the cannonball hit, where does it skip, nothing like that. Never, ever. That that just wasn't done. Who are you cheating but yourself? Who you did? You know what? What's the point? Um, keeping the character sheet. I'll be honest, I'm I'm pretty sure that I can remember everything you've gotten over the course of any, um, you know, the adventures you've played in my game. So showing up one week with uh, some new whiz-bang item, no, nah, that isn't going to fly. I'm going to catch it. And if I don't, I'll bet some of the other players will. But I, I, I just, I can't, I don't even, I never even considered who keeps the sheets. Who are you cheating? It's like whether you're fudging die rolls. As a DM, yes, I have fudged die rolls. I do it frequently at conventions. Why? Well, I didn't want the, the player doesn't have to die yet. You know, and it's not going to add to the fun we're having. Because convention games are not campaigns. They don't. Get you up a level, get you, in, you know, I'm not talking about tournaments. I'm talking about my goofy wheel of blames. So I fudge behind the, behind the screen, always in a player's favor. Or on the rare occasion, it isn't a player's favor. It's for a laugh, which, you know, never killed a player. Um, I just, I, I never considered writing everything down. Who wants all that book work? Crap, keep your own records. I trust you. Cheat, you cheat yourself. You don't cheat me. I'm just telling the story. Well, let's see. What else? Well, I won't be doing one a week from today because I will be in Madison, Wisconsin, going to... Uh, can you see that? Game Hole Con. Um, <clears throat> can't wait going to be a great time. Halloween is going to be insane. All the local families have been invited to bring their kids up to the exhibition hall. All the dealers are going to be in costume giving away stuff. All, you know, the true dungeon, the living dungeon, all the cosplayers. Oh, it's going to be whack. 
it's going to be fun. I hope it's a Halloween. Those kids, you know, especially the four, five, six year olds, hope it's one they never ever forget. Um, going to be playing some games with some good friends. Going to be playing another uh, dirt track Saturday night with some returning dra- drivers. So I know that'll be a great game. Um, got to spend a couple of days. Well, I got to spend a day with on some personal business. And then coming home, I'm going to swing by and see my friend Juan, who I spoke about earlier, who's now been in, admitted to, uh, um, let's see, what is the name of the hospital? University of Illinois Chicago Hospital. Um, and uh, see him and see about uh, finding a way to help him uh, deal with his artwork and uh, make arrangements for it. And um, I hope everybody has a good Halloween. I know I'll probably have a great Halloween. I'm giving out Smarties and Dum Dums. And you can imagine I'll be having some fun with that. I'm going to be going as the erudite Viking. And on that note, I'll tell you all, da 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 go be. Welcome to my cellar. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs. Still quite a feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man around when the race went down. Calling Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess. Let me edit, we'll have success. D and D and Dragon Magazine. He's a curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs, but still quite the feller, curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. From psionics to the game, you attack that wizard's brain. DSR and fantasy, collection of micro armory. Tight with tramp under a tree. High as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Curmudgeon.